Hi, this is Andre again. The last time we looked at what we described as a bug of the uh, VIA uh, 6522 shift register. This time we're going more into the details of the shift register, uh, how to use it and um, some other features of the VIA. We're also looking into some applications of the shift register. We're benchmarking the Commodore's fast serial bus uh, that I implemented using this shift register. And we have some exciting news from Western Design Center, the current makers of the uh, VIA. So stay tuned. So last time we looked at the shift register and uh, what may be a potential problem with it um, or depending on uh, how you use it. And today I want to go more into the positive side and show you some very exciting uses of the shift register where it functions absolutely well. Um, and uh, one of the most important things that you do with a shift re register like this today is SPI. So let's look at into some SPI and other applications of the shift register. Just a little recap. The VIA6522 is an I.O. chip. It's called Versatile Interface Adapter because it has a lot of flexible I.O. in there. Um, and besides the uh, processor interface here, um, you have two 8-bit ports and each of the 8-bit ports has two uh, additional control ports. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the features uh, in that chip uh, uh, later on, there's also timer in there. And uh, the CB1 and CB2 can be used uh, for shift register operation, which means that you can shift out uh, serial data or shift in serial data on CB2 and have the uh, clock of that uh, shift uh, on CB1 either going out or, or coming into uh, to the device. So with several modes for um, shifting out and in. So we have uh, depending on timer and, and clock source. What we call the shift register bug is that uh, when shifting in and or shifting out under external CB1 clock control, the CB1 input um, receives a shift clock and on the low high transition, the VIA is supposed to uh, latch in every bit of data uh, from on the CB2 uh, data input line. However, on specific conditions and relations between Phi2 system clock and CB1 input shift clock, and we'll talk about that uh, later in more detail, um, those shift clocks uh, are not registered and a bit is being missed. And we will have a look at uh, that in more detail later on. But now uh, let's have a look at some successful applications. Let me show you how I implemented the SPI interface with the VIA shift register. So I've written it up on this web page that I'm going to link in the description below. The schematic is actually totally simple. Um, there is the shift register interface on CB1 and CB2 that's go that is being used and there is the 8-bit port for the other side of the communication because the reason is you can only shift in one direction with the shift register but uh, SPI is a bi-directional protocol and, and is a um, well kind of full duplex protocol because you send out eight clock pulses at the same time you send data and, and at the very same time you also receive a byte of data. So the, the mode I've uh, decided to use is I shift out on the VIA shift register. So it, the VIA generates the data and the clock lines, which are going over here to that uh, XOR gate, which I'm talking going to talk about a bit in a moment. And the data that's coming in is going into that simple shif shift register uh, IC. It's a simple 74 LS 164. You can use HCT or whatever. Um, that takes the zero data, takes the SPI clock, and converts it into 8-bit parallel data. So that's 
totally easy. However, there are some complications due to SPI modes. Now let's look, what are SPI modes? So, um, this is by, by the way taken from the uh, Wikipedia page for, uh, for SPI. Um, unfortunately, there is no real standard for SPI and so four modes are possible. And you can see them here with the notation of uh, clock polarization zero and one and clock phases zero and one. And the, the difference between those is on which phase of the clock, which means is it the first transition of the clock signal or the second transition of the clock signal that the data is taken over by the device. In clock phase zero, it's the first transition of the clock signal. In phase one, it's the second transition of the clock signal. And depending on the clock polarity, that's either rising or falling edge. So what you can see here, and when you compare it to the um, uh, shift register um, description in the data sheet, you can see here that uh, the shift clock is this one. It's uh, typically high, idle high, and then it has low pulses for each bit, and it shifts out the data after uh, the clock goes low. And then when you look at the, the corresponding diagram, it shifts in the data when the clock goes high. So if you look at the um, SPI modes, this is basically clock polarity one and clock phase one. So this is actually mode three. So what do you do with devices that are not um, not mode three? So you can, you can easily invert the clock um, and then you get uh, polarity uh, zero, but you cannot easily convert the phase because the, it is as it is, the VIA shifts out the data on the first clock transition and uh, shifts in on the second clock transition. To implement the other modes, I took advantage of the fact that the data of the uh, shift register output changes after the first transition of the clock. So there is a certain delay. The data sheet says there's uh, the first after the first Phi 2 clock, system clock, after the shift clock, then the data is going to change. So there's a little hold time. And uh, so what, what we need to do is we need to make sure that this bit here, the, fir the, the first bit is already there. And then using the VIA, it, the data would change at this red line, but it changes a little after that. So, yeah, I, I took I took advantage of that uh, of that uh, delay in the VIA and the whole time, uh, so that the devices that are using um, phase phase zero all uh, um, uh, can take over the data on this uh, on this first clock transition and still have it stable for at least some, some minimum time uh, on, on, the, on the data line. Your mileage may vary, um, but that is, this is how I actually implemented SD cards because that, that's how SD cards work. And what did I do? I used these XOR gates to uh, invert um, the, the, the clock and the, and the data line as needed. And how do I, did I implement that uh, the first bit is all already available here in, the, in that area that is actually gray on, when you look at the VIA timing, but this is, uh, but should be valid if you look at the phase zero timing. And what I make sure is that when I shift out one byte, the, that the last bit is always zero. And the last bit is still on the data line when you start in the, the first uh, when you start uh, shifting in here so but yeah how do I make that because and that that's then then easy because if I know that the last bit here is always uh, the last bit which is always zero uh, and I have to shift out bit seven because this is the order in which the bits are shifted in, in, in SPI 
and I have to shift out uh, um, a bit seven of one, I just invert the data line and also the rest of the, of the, of the bits. Um, so that the, the actual bit seven is already there set basically manually. And then the shift register bit seven is set as the second bit that is taken by the device and so on. And the last shift register bit is actually the one after uh, the device has taken hey, taken in the last byte, so I can I can so it's ignored by the device, and I can make sure that that I can use the fact that I can keep it zero, and then invert it on the on the next one, and that's uh, here in the code. So the first the first uh, thing we do is uh, I make sure that the the last bit that is shifted bit zero is is uh, is zero. And I take the, the bit seven into the carry using this this uh, opcode a aromatic shift left. And if that if that bit is also zero, I just store the byte into the shift register and uh, can send it. But if that byte is uh, if that bit seven of the data is is one, I have to invert. Um, uh, I have to invert. The, the data line and then because I have I invert the data line for all the transfer I also have to invert uh, the actual data that I store into the shift register and uh, yeah then then I can uh, go and wait uh, until uh, until it's finished and then I, I reset the inverter again and then that makes sure that at the next byte the data is um, uh, is, is zero on the, on the line. So, um, yeah, this way the VIA can actually do SPI mode zero given a little bit, uh, um, yeah, on the, on the, in, on the, on the whole time of the data, but I made manage to do SPI, uh, cards with that setup. Another project that is using the VIA uh, for SPI is actually the Steckschwein computer from some uh, very nice guys here in, in Germany. Uh, they have documented their hardware as well and uh, they use a different approach. They um, shift out the data by um, a bit by bit um, by, by using the CPU as control. Um, but shifting in the result, uh, the, the, the response from the device uh, here, the uh, master in slave out MISO um, into the shift register. So they're using even that mode, um, that famous mode shift in under external control. And why does it work? Uh, because that works, because the clock is actually made by the VIA itself. So it's, it has a timing that is synchronous to the system clock, which is where the shift register just works fine. If you keep, uh, again, keep it out of that, um, out of that area where, where Phi 2, the system clock uh, has its uh, falling edge and it works, works very well. So you can see here that I'm running the test board without the actual shift register fix, which is on that board. Um, so let me show you how I worked around that. So let me show you some test program. And of course, uh, I should use the right commands. So as you can see here, it's showing you the disk status. And I have another one. And this one, you can see here, it shows you the directory using the fast protocol. So how did I actually do that? Um, you can see this is the schematic for the board. You have the uh, IEC input output, uh, which is basically a copy of the 1581 disk drive uh, circuit. You can see here the uh, shift register uh, direction switch. Um, but what you can see here is those two extra ICs, the, these uh, shift registers. and. Uh, together with some very ni nice features of the VIA, 
we can build a, a very simple replacement for uh, for a shift register. First of all, you have here the uh, fast clock that's coming in here, and you can see the fast clock goes into both shift registers, and the fast data is going into one shift register that then then presents the data to port A of the VIA. The second one here has the um, fast clock, um, but as input it only has a high value and the reset input is actually um, connected to the VIA as, as is the last bit. And that, that's where it gets interesting because this is a bit counter. And uh, I'm using CA2 uh, pulse mode output to uh, clear the, the, the register, the shift register, so all bits get zeroed out. And anytime we get uh, a bit in from uh, the fast clock, we don't care about which bit, if it's zero or one, so no connection to data, but we just shift in a one into the shift re register, and after the eighth shift, this output line goes high. Yeah, when when I, when CA two um, gives out the pulse, clears that this output line goes low. But then after eight shift in uh, pulses, uh, this line goes high, and this goes to CA one, and this is an interrupt input for the VIA. And therefore, the code can check has this uh, has this happened already, and if so, it can read this from the uh, read the data from port A because it has at the same time been shifted into the second uh, shift register. And these are the two extra chips uh, that that are now populated on uh, on the board. Now that we've been uh, looking into how I use the shift register and then others use the shift register for serial communications, and we've some gotten some glance of advanced features like handshake mode, let's have a look at the details of these features. Now I want to give you some examples of the advanced features of the VIA. The first one is latching, which means that you can uh, latch in data from the I.O. ports into the register at uh, an active CA1 transition or CB1, the same for port B transition, uh, which is a very nifty feature for other I.O. chips. You uh, would either have to use an interrupt uh, handler that on that active transition reads the I.O. port and stores the data away or you would have a separate uh, chip uh, on on your on your board to take the data, so you can read it at your at your own leisure. But here the VIA has that uh, uh, latching on both ports, actually, so it's a very nifty feature. The other one is handshake control. So you want to exchange data with uh, eight bit of data with with another system, and the system can just a signal with an active transition on CA1 that some data is ready on the port, maybe maybe latched or not. But then you just uh, in handshake mode, you read the port A and the VA automatically either sets, uh, sends a pulse on CA2 as an acknowledgement of the VIA that the data has been taken or uh, it sets the uh, CA2 uh, down and uh, uh, lets it get up in the next active transition of CA1 in, 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 in this kind of handshake mode. So that's also a very nifty feature um, where you can very easily exchange data and have an automatic knowledge with the other system. And the same happens uh, with uh, uh, right handshake as well. The VIA has two timers. Timer 1 is a full 16-bit timer that uh, counts from the initial value down uh, until it uh, reaches zero and then reloads the details, look at the datasheet, then reloads uh, and, and counts down again. Um, one nifty feature that you have here is that you can actually 
if you look at uh, this part of the data sheet, you can output uh, a signal, a timed signal based on timer one on PB7, port B7, bit seven. So that's very nice and it's independent of any IRQ uh, in interrupt response or whatever. Timer two is a little bit more complicated. I'll look into that in a, um, when I look at the shift register, but the, the main point is it's a 16 bit timer, but it only counts down and does not reload itself. So if it goes down to zero, it goes to minus one, which is basically uh, FFFF hex uh, and then counts down back again. 65,536 pulses to the next, uh, um, to the next uh, underflow and, and so on. The interesting is you can use um, a timer two to count pulses on port bit six. So it's also a very nifty feature if you need to count any, any kind of uh, uh, pulses coming in from some external device, you can use that. Timer 2 has two peculiarities, and that is uh, one, there is only a low order latch, and then there is a 16 bit counter. So why is that why is that important? Because the high order counter just counts down from the values you set it, and then there's no way where the VIA should take uh, the value from to reset the timer to a specific value when it underflows, which is different from timer one, which has high order latch. So that's one of the reasons uh, plays into the part that timer two, when going into underflow does not reload and just counts down to minus one, minus two and so on. The second one is timer two is the source for the shift register. The shift register continuously puts out bits. So how does that work? And that, <laughs> in this case, timer two only works as an eight bit timer. Uh, in, in, if you look at uh, how the shift register works, you will find that only uh, the low order counter counts and only the underflows of the low order counter are timed for each half bit in fact. So when the low order counter underflows, it is being reloaded from the low order latch. When the high order counter just continues to go down and it's totally ignored. And that uh, becomes important when we look at uh, how we can uh, send out a byte from the zero shift register, which is the next part. So this is the code that the fast serial bus uses to transfer a byte. First note that when we enter that routine, the, serial, the shift register is in input mode and waiting on clock pulses from CB1 because that's the standard in, in that uh, serial protocol. And every time you want to send a byte, you have to switch over to sending mode, sending based on timer two in this case. Um, this is, this is different from probably other operations because in other operations you, you usually keep it in one mode and, and it stays there and you just store, store a value into the shift register and, it, and it's, uh, it's sent out. But uh, showing you how the shift register reacts when you switch the modes uh, sheds some more light on the internals and, and, the, and the things you have to you have to take care of and also explains how this how this protocol is implemented with the shift register if we enter the routine as i said the shift register uh, the shift register is in input mode the timer 2 is a normal mode which means it's a simple 16 bit timer and even if you started with the value of 1 so low low byte of the counter is 1 high byte is 0 it will have underflown and it has gone through minus one, which is FFFF hex or, and then counted down, whatever it may be at any, any one number. And when we, when we um, then start to uh, switch modes of the shift register to output with uh, timer two, 
it's still it may be in any kind of number it's maybe just a few couple of cycles after we entered that uh, that routine but still it may be in any kind of cycle and so the next underflow happens at some point we don't know and um, only when that underflow happens the shifting actually starts so you can see here that i try to kind of uh, graphically uh, this describe how cb1 uh, clock output is working and where the cb2 data is coming out but uh, you you cannot say at what what point in time uh, this timer um, when when you start the timer uh, the, the shift register output based on timer 2 when the first bit will actually happen so and therefore we in the in this routine we store the value in the shift register so we are prepared that shift can happen anytime we switch the direction of the drivers to output and then what we do is we restart the timer and what changes when we restart the timer the timer then is reset we store any value into timer high in this case it's uh, this value may, maybe something similar uh, depending on the on the state of the port b i've just taken this value as an example uh, but the load timer low value is taken from the latch so it's set to one and then it underflows and uh, you can see then we have here um, actually uh, this is going this way and then we uh, uh, oh, I, I miscalculated actually so because this is uh, this should be this one and all the others should be one down so I've updated the numbers in the meantime so when the timer is reloaded the low byte is set to one as it's taken from the timer uh, low latch timer to low latch and then it then it counts down and then it underflows and when it underflows the low byte of the timer goes to 255 ff hex and then we have basically 255 cycles until the next underflow which is quite an amount and that doesn't change when we um when when we enable shift register output based on timer 2 it still has to wait the other some 230 cycles until the first underflow happens in that specific timer mode and then the first uh, the shifting starts the first bit gets shifted out and as you can see um, every half bit is one timer underflow and um, because then timer 2 is in a shift register mode it only uses the low byte to underflow so when the low byte underflows it's being reset high byte is actually counted down and then the low byte underflows uh, it, oops, uh, and then the low byte is set from the latch again and so every half when we, when we use one as a latch value the ha every half bit of that byte is uh, three cycles because the timer is reloaded on underflow of timer two low byte when we look at the code here here we start the shift out under control and then that that's the reason to to shorten that time we actually restart the timer again when we look at this and here we see that uh, the first part is basically still the same until we enable the timer two output it's still the same but then we restart the timer and with some value actually in this case it's this value which is uh, which is stored here because it's it, it doesn't matter what we write into the timer high byte because only the timer low byte counts in this mode and uh, and then you can see the timer immediately goes to the value of uh, one 
the low byte as we set it to ledge and then shifting immediately starts after that and then we save basically 230 cycles of that of that shift phase uh, of, of that count phase of timer two so on that and then the next thing is you just wait for the time uh, for the byte to have been shifted out completely by looking at um, the bit in the interrupt flag register of the uh, of the VIA and then you, you clear clear that bit as well. Uh, please note it's not cleared by just reading the interrupt flag register like on the CIA. Here you actually have to write to the interrupt flag register um, and you can you can clear out every single bit which is very handy when you have independent drivers for multiple um, interrupt sources on the VIA which is not a nice feature which ac actually the CIA lacks. So this is the code and this is rather optimized took a while um, but uh, I use it to implement the fast zero protocol from Commodore with the VIA shift register. Now that we've looked at various way of using the shift register and how you configure it and, and so on, what's it now with that bug? So first let's uh, revisit what is actually happening and what are the conditions that we find. So after I published my uh, last video, Martin Tira contacted me and uh, he told me that he had bit, uh, built a test rig for the VIA 6522, where he's able to, uh, you, to control all the lines of the VIA uh, with a, a fast microcontroller. And uh, he collaborated uh, with me to uh, create uh, the appropriate tests. And uh, the first test uh, he did was with the MOS 6522. And let's look at the results. So let's look at the result uh, that Martin got with his uh, test setup. Here's the uh, logic analyzer um, output. And uh, there are the various uh, signal lines that he has captured. And uh, he has uh, written a decoder for that so we can very easily zoom in to specific places. What you can see here, I um, show the most important ones. This is phi2, this is read minus uh, write, uh, chip select, and here the shift register, clock and data. And the test setup is as follows. First, the auxiliary uh, control register is written to set input from external uh, from external clock. Uh, then you're writing a zero into the shift register. And then we're reading the shift register to see it's actually still zero. And after the whole uh, test, we see the shift register is not full of ones as we would expect because as we can see here, during all of the shifts that we have, we see that the, the data input is always one and we have eight shift pulses. But what we can see here is, of course, uh, that only three of the bits have been shifted into the shift register. So what Martin has done, he has uh, been varying the time between the uh, rising edge of the shift register clock and the falling edge of phi2. And in this case, you can see here, it starts with 80 nanoseconds. Uh, if you look up here, 80 nanoseconds uh, for, the, for the first bit. And when we go to the, to a later one, like here, so we see, for example, we have this one. And then take the, uh, take like so. You see, we have 20 nanoseconds. 
So in this way, he was able to see um, um, that not all bits are get, get shifted in, and thus we have missing clock pulses. The first one measurement was for uh, MOS 6522. Here we have one for the Western Design Center. So the reason we have some different tests is because initially Martin couldn't find any problems with the Western Design part. Um, however, then we thought, okay, the Western Design part is rated for 14 megahertz, the most part for one megahertz. So um, we assumed also the window of error might be might be very very small and uh, we indeed we found basically only because of the limitations clock frequency and so on of the of the test setup uh, what we could do is uh, we could put the um, rising edge of uh, the shift register clock at the same time instance as the falling edge of um, phi 2 of the system clock and uh, this is the same setup here. Uh, we read the shift register is zero in be before. We have eight shift pulses. We have data is one. And uh, after that, we still read zero from the shift register. So it's not has not been shifted in uh, even in the Western design part. So we've seen that shift pulses uh, get lost during shift under external clock, which we think is a bug. But a bug is only if the ship chip doesn't work to a specification, and the specification here is ambiguous. So as we contacted Bill Mensch from Western Design Center, we got some interesting insight. The VIA shift register was not intended for asynchronous clocks, that is a shift register clock that is not fully synchronized with the actual VIA system clock. He clearly mentions it as a synchronous serial port. If it's not, it was not designed for that use case, we can't really blame it up to be a bug, can we? When the VIC-20 development started in 1979, Bill Mensch had already left Commodore to found uh, Western Design Center licensing the 6502 and 6522 technology as it was. Obviously, nobody from Commodore talked to him about the problems they had, uh, which he considers weird. So this asynchronous use case was only coming uh, to his attention by communication from Garth Wilson from the 6502.org forum uh, and me when I was researching for that, uh, for that video. So what will Western Design Center now do about that? First, they will update the documentation with this usage and uh, how it should be handled and uh, with, uh, as I understand, the fix that Garth Wilson has proposed in the forum and that I also presented in my last video. Second, Western Design Center will make sure that the uh, hardware description language versions, the, the soft core logic versions they sell, will work properly for that use case. And third, they will continue to supply chips with the current state. So with that more synchronous side of, uh, of shift register use, but if they need to create a new mask revision uh, for whatever reason, they will enable the asynchronous use case of the shift register uh, then, finally. So let's hope that at some point in time, we will hopefully get a fixed VIA. As you've seen in the preview in my, my last video, I have managed to create uh, the fast serial protocol using the VIA, uh, using a shift register. And uh, now uh, let's have a look at a benchmark between a parallel IEEE 488, serial IEC, uh, serial pro bus protocol, and fast serial bus protocol. Very interesting. So here's the setup I use for benchmarking. So here's my PET replica. Uh, it's got a parallel IEEE 488 bus going to that Nano 488, which is connected to my 
PC, which is doing disk unit 11. It's also connected via that IEEE 488 cable to the 2031 disk drive, which is uh, unit 8. It's got a serial line connection to these two, which is a 15412 and a 1571. And this one is, of course, using the slow serial protocol, and this one uh, will be using the fast serial protocol. I've written a driver for the serial and parallel bus that distinguishes whether to use the serial or the parallel bus using the unit number. And it's uh, because I'm running on a replica, I can patch the ROM, so-called ROM, because here it's actually running in, in fast RAM. So uh, let me load the driver. So now the driver is installed. And I can do a unit, uh, the directory on unit 8. I can do a directory on unit 9. Uh, maybe not. Okay. And I can do a directory on unit 10. As you can see, all of them have 64K pseudo random file uh, on disk already. And I'm going to benchmark the load speed by rereading that pseudo uh, random file and comparing it to what it actually should be, like I did in my, my last video. And for the fun of it, I'm also going to benchmark the uh, PC solution that has the same file here. To run the benchmark, I need to run to load the benchmark program. And it's on my PC drive. And I can change the unit to use using uh, this poke and we'll start with the 1571 and so let's start it. The benchmark is just reading this uh, 64k of pseudo random data and compares it to what it should actually be and then it prints out some statistics. So, close to a minute. Now, let's see how the 1541 goes. And this is number 10. I need to switch disks because I found I only can read this disk reliable in all drives. So, let's start again. So that's really a lot slower. Now let's look at the original drive. Set the unit to 8 and start again. Nice, isn't it? It's basically as fast as the fast serial bus from Commodore. And now for the fun of it, 
let's test and of course during my last test the camera went out so let's redo it again with drive 11 which is the pc drive and then let's see how long that takes ah sorry So what you can see here is it's basically twice as fast as uh, the IEEE 488 or the fast serial bus and there you can see which part is of the um, bus overhead and which part is of the disk overhead. So I've taken some more runs off camera and did some statistics. Uh, they're pretty consistent. There were some variations in sub-second, but because I measured manually, I don't want to give the impression of accuracy where there isn't. So those are the averages anyway. And if you look at the comparison between those numbers, we you can see that um, the fast serial of the 1571 and the original IEEE-488 are basically the same speed. I used this one uh, as a basis. The 1541 took basically three times longer to read that file, while the PC disk drive took only about half of it. Now, the loading of the file is consists of two parts. First, the mechanical part, like reading from the disk, and the second one, um, transferring it over the bus. Now, assuming that the PC host version basically is only bus overhead compared to the 2031 version, which are both connected on the IEEE 488 bus. So we have this as a mechanical part. This is really a, an assumption and very hand waving, but should give you an, uh, just an idea how, how much faster the buses actually are. So we get the actual part of the bus how fast is is the bus itself for those uh, um, what it, what it takes and um, it's also not fair because the 1571 is maybe a bit faster but in the end it the disk turns with the same speed the bits come in at the same speed so it shouldn't be that much of a difference so we see that the serial of the 1541 is about five to six times slower than either the fast serial bus or IEEE 488. Yeah, quite a bummer. One additional note here. Here you can see a capture of the um, fast serial bus transfer with the fast Zero clock down here. You can see the, the clock pulses for um, for the fast uh, shift register work, and uh, you can you can actually see one is faster than the other. That depends on the timing parameter. I believe this should be as I send it to the drive, and this is I think the drive sending to me, but it could be reversed. Um, but what you can see also is that there still is quite some overhead. Uh, which is uh, um, depending on the bus protocol overhead here and also the, the overhead that is uh, required to actually process the byte on, uh, on, on the pad. And uh, the, the point uh, to make here is I'm not using the actual burst load protocol of the 1571, which is even more optimized. So if you're loading um, a file on in burst mode, or which is basically standard on the 1571, it's even faster than that. But I haven't measured that. I, ha I, I that would mean some more extensive changes into into that driver and and the petrom. So may, maybe at some later date, but not today. So just to remind you, this is not the burst protocol. This is just normal fast serial. Uh, serial bus. So coming to an end. This video has gotten quite long and technical again. 
So I went through some of the features of that nice little chip uh, of the VIA and I hope you uh, have gotten some more appreciation for that uh, really nice chip with the features that uh, yeah maybe spares you some extra hardware that you would have to use in, in other solutions. Also look deeply into how to use the shift register uh, even for modern solutions like SPI and we look deeper into when shift clock pulses are being missed and we finally got a clarification from Western Design Center why that is the case and the announcement that they plan to change that when they do a next mask revision of, of that chip, which is really good news. So I hope you like it. Thanks for watching and see you next time.